This Parsha podcast is sponsored in honor of Jonathan Sher on the occasion of his 30th birthday, which is today. And it's sponsored by his wife, Rebecca, who wishes him a lifetime of happiness, of ongoing weekly Parsha podcast listening, of growth in your Judaism, of rock climbing and crazy heights, and the opportunity for many more adventures. Happy birthday, Jonathan. And on behalf of the entire Parsha podcast family, we wish you many happy returns. Now, we are not recording from the Torch Center. This week, we undertook our annual drive to Canada. We left Monday, Monday to Memphis, Tuesday to Cincinnati, and Wednesday, yesterday, today's Thursday, we arrived in Canada. And we do this every year. As longtime listeners know, we try to escape the torturous Houston heat and spend time with the family north of the border. So we're not in the Torch Center right now. And we will be out of the country, please God, for the next couple of weeks. And the hope is, the prayer is, that we're not going to miss a single Parsha podcast as we managed to do last year. And if you remember from last year, the hardest part for me is to find a suitable recording environment. So please don't have that over the course of the summer. But we're not in the Torch Center. But I hope, I hope that this is something that could change over the next couple of weeks. How so? I am going to make an appeal. I'm going to file a petition to give the Torch Center, to give it Air Force One standing. Now, this analogy might not make a ton of sense to our sizable international audience, but the President of the United States has an airplane called the Air Force One. Now, the truth is that there are actually two such airplanes, and they're identical in every way. So the idea is if one of them is in service, the other one is operational. But the truth is, it's not technically true. The plane that is currently carrying the president is always called Air Force One. So I want to give the Torch Center, I want to give it Air Force One status that any room or any venue that is host to a Parsha podcast recording automatically gets catapulted to the status of a Torch Center for the duration of the production. That's my plan. And I'm going to make a petition to the Torch board to this effect. And I will let you know what happens of that. And as always, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Now this week we have a very interesting Parsha with one of the most destructive and devastating events of our history. The nation is under the impression that their entrance into the land is imminent. And Moshe sends 12 ostensibly pious and righteous men on a reconnaissance mission to scout out the land and to come back and report what they find. And these 12 men, one representing every tribe, they reconnoiter the land for 40 days and they return with a devastating report. Although they acknowledge... The land is indeed flowing with milk and honey. They say that the people who live there are mighty and fearsome and their defenses and cities are impregnable and we can conquer it. We should appoint a new head and return to Egypt. And two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, they remain loyal to God and they argue that if we have God on our side, We're going to carve up the Canaanites like bread. But the nation buys the story of the other 10 spies. They take it hook, line, and sinker, and they sob needlessly that night. This night is the first Tisha B'Av, and God said to the Jewish people, okay, you want to cry? I'll give you a good reason to cry. And ever since then, we've been sobbing over all the calamities that have befallen our people on this day on that night. Now, the Almighty is incensed with the nation's lack of faith. And he threatens, as was the case with the golden calf, he threatens to eradicate the nation and to start over fresh with just Moshe. And again, Moshe successfully intercedes on the people's behalf and the Almighty accedes to his intercession. But nevertheless, the nation is punished 
They are condemned to wander in the wilderness for 40 years in punishment for the spy's 40-day journey throughout the land. Every day results in one year in the wilderness. Moreover, the nation is told that everyone who is an adult, who is somehow complicit with this crime, they're all going to die and the generation is going to be recycled and their descendants, their children, who don't have the taint, who don't have the stain of this sin, they're going to be the ones to inherit the land, but everyone else will pass in the wilderness with the exception of Joshua and Caleb. Afterwards, a cadre of Jews defiantly march into the land in opposition to the will of God, in express violation of Moshe, and they were slaughtered by the Amalekites. So that's the beginning of our Parsha, the episode of the spies and everything that happened as a result, the consequences and after effects of this terrible sin where these spies who were righteous spoke negatively about the land, slandered the land, and unleashed this terrible cascading events and consequences of 40 years of suffering, or of wandering, shall we say. Afterwards, the parasha transitions in an interesting fashion. The nation is given several laws. Number one, they're told that when they bring sacrifices, you have to accompany with the sacrifices meal offerings and wine libations. And then we have the laws of challah. You have to separate from the challah dough, just like we have various different tithes. The truma to the Kohen, the miser, the tithe into the Levite. We have a part of the tithing process that comes from the dough. After the flour is ground up into dough, you take the first part of the dough and give it to the Kohen. And then we have the protocol for erroneously worshipping idols, the various sacrifices that such sins trigger. So these very seemingly random laws, miscellaneous laws. And then there are two parts to end of the parsha. We have the episode of the twig gatherer. There's a man who's caught gathering twigs on Shabbos, and he is executed for violating the Shabbos. And finally, the parsha ends with the third paragraph of the Shema, in which the nation is told about the laws of Tzitzis. You have the strings, the fringes on the side of your garments, with the blue techeles wool wrapped around it as well. So that's the Parsha. Now, if you zoom out, look at the Parsha holistically, it seems like our Parsha has four distinct and seemingly completely unrelated subject matters. We have the episode of the Scouts, the Spies, and all its consequences. And then we have this collection of laws, libations, meal offerings, challah, and the various sacrifices that must be brought in the event that there is an erroneous sin. And then we have the twig gatherer who was executed after Moshe consulted with God. And then the third paragraph of the Shema, which talks about the tzitzis and remembering the mitzvahs of Hashem and not deviating after your eyes and after your heart. It seems like it's somewhat of an unusual constellation of subjects. We could even say, you know, you'd be hard-pressed You'd have a hard time finding four Torah sections with less in common, at least on the surface. But I always like to think of this parsha. You get the feeling that the parsha is about the spies and other miscellaneous things. And a question I want to ponder and pursue is what is the internal consistency between the various subjects of our parsha? Why are they lumped together? Of course, there has to be internal consistency in the Torah. You don't just have random ideas that are just put in random places. But in our parsha, it seems to be fleetingly hard to try to piece it all together. In fact, you'd even frame this as a question. There were two people who were executed over the course of the 40 years in the wilderness. We had the blasphemer that we read about in the end of the book of Leviticus. And we have the individual here is the twig gatherer. And the Talmud actually says that those two events were contemporaneous. They happened at the same time. Yet for some reason, the narrative of these two stories are divided up. And we're told one of them 
in Parsha's Emor and one of them in our Parsha. And it's somewhat hard to understand how it fits in. What is the central theme of our Parsha? What is the overarching message? Now, to be fair, Rashi, in his inimitable style, he addresses some of our questions. He tells us that after the devastating news that the nation is going to be subject to 40 years in the wilderness, they get like a modicum of comfort. Because chapter 15, verse 2, it talks about the libations, the wine libations. you got to pour the wine at the base of the altar. The verse starts off by telling the nation, when you arrive in the land of Israel, then you have this system of laws regarding the libations. The libations is only applicable in the land. Says Rashi, the Almighty is revealing to them is forecasting to them, even though you think about it, you know, 40 years down the line. What now is 2022? What's 40 years from now? It's the 2060s. It seems like it's a lifetime away. Nevertheless, the nation is comforted. It will happen. Eventually, the conquest of the land will be completed. But in general, the Parsha kind of demands an explanation where it seems so unnatural, the segues and the transitions and the continuity. Now, I mentioned that we traveled throughout this vast land over the course of this week. We uh, we left on Monday and we drove to Memphis. And then on Tuesday, we went to Cincinnati, which is the home of my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, the brother-in-law that I've quoted many times on the podcast, Rabbi Botnick, Rabbi Shmuley Botnick. And I stayed by his house. They were kind enough and gracious enough to host us as we were traveling through their city. And of course, we started chatting about the Parsha. And I told him, I said, listen, you know, I'm trying to work on a Parsha podcast. It's kind of hard. I'm driving on the highway. How are you supposed to prepare? And then he tells me, well, Shlach is, is my favorite, one of my favorites. I said, great, I need some help. And he says, you need a Parsha podcast. I have enough material for three Parsha podcasts. So I said, great. I have my microphone in the car. I'll pull it out. We'll start recording. Ultimately, we did not record. But I was discussing this question with him. And he shared with me his resolution to this question to understand the continuity and the consistency of our Parsha. And what he told me was kind of, mind-blowing and mind-bending. I'm going to share with you his answer before I tell you mine. He said something amazing. We know that Adam did something really consequential in the garden when he consumed from the tree of knowledge, good and evil, Eitzadas Tov Vara. What was the nature of this tree? It was a fruit tree, but what kind of fruit tree? So the Talmud offers three opinions. Everyone agrees it was not an apple tree. I don't know where that comes from, but it's not from our sources. The Talmud tells us the book of Brachos, page 40a, three different opinions. According to Rabbi Meir, it was a geffen, it was a vine. According to Rabbi Nechemia, it was a figa, te'ena. According to Rabbi Yehuda, it was a chita, it was a wheat. Three different interpretations. Was it grapes from a vine? Was it figs from a fig tree? Or was it wheat? And the Talmud actually proves from this that it must be that wheat is a kind of fruit. But how do we understand this Talmud? I think if you gain some experience in decrypting such enigmatic statements, you'll understand that each one of these sages in the Talmud is highlighting a different element of Adam's blunder. Rabbi Meir says, it had to do with grapes. And he points out that grapes comes from wine, and wine unleashes all kinds of trauma and devastation and destruction. And that's what began Adam's freefall. 
comes along Rabbi Nehemia, and he says it was a feed because after they discover their nakedness, they cover themselves with a fig leaf. And it makes a, an abundance of sense to say that the same item, the same fruit that they blundered with, they began their process of rectification with. Comes along Rabbi Yehuda and he says, it's got to be wheat because wheat is when, when a child begins to eat wheat, begins to eat bread, that is when they begin to call their father by his name. Now, obviously, this is a very advanced Talmud we've talked about in the past. But we could say simply that our sages are revealing that Adam's sin was comprised of various different dimensions and elements. One of them was the grape. One of them was the wheat. And one of them was a fig. There is even an opinion that says it was, an, it was a unique kind of produce that was a combination of these three. But this is revealing that the sin of Adam existed on three different planes, on three different dimensions. As a result of that, the damage was on three different levels, and therefore the rectification must also be on three different levels, on three different dimensions. You have to have one for the grape, and one for the fig, and one for the wheat. Now, in a stroke of sheer genius, Rabbi Botnik calculated that the Hebrew words for wheat and grape and fig, which is chita and gefen and teina, if you compile the numerical value of all three together, it arrives at number 611, which of course is a great number to have as your address. But it's also the gematria of the word Torah. Chita, Gefen, Te'ena equals 611, which is the same number as Torah. Adam caused damage with his sin. He mixed in the good and bad with his sin. He imbibed from the tree of knowledge good and bad. The only way to restore the way things were prior, to separate the good and the bad once again, is via Torah, which is this fusion, so to speak, of the wheat rectification and the fig rectification and the grape rectification. Now, this idea is even hinted to in the Talmud itself. The Talmud says that with what they sinned, they rectified. With what Adam and Eve sinned, they rectified, and therefore that was the argument to say that it was, in fact, a fig. Now, what does this have to do with our Parsha? A lot, apparently. The sin of the spies, if you look at it from the big perspective, it mirrors the sin of Adam and Eve. Of course, the sin of Adam and Eve brought death and destruction, and the sin of the spies brought death and destruction. But on a more granular level, structurally, it mirrors, it mimics the sin of Adam. Adam's blunder was that he mixed the good and the bad. The tree of knowledge, good and evil. What the spies do? The spies did the same thing. There was a land that God prepared for us. It was a land that was completely good. Tovah ha'aretz me'od me'od. It's very exceptionally, exceedingly good. And they injected bad into it. They muddled it with this mixture of good and bad. And in fact, the verse in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 1, verse 39, uses the same terminology of good and bad, mixing good and bad, as is featured in the sin of Adam. The verse uses it to describe what the spies did. Consequently, if you think about the sin of the spies, the damage that that brought about was akin to the damage brought about by the sin of Adam. And therefore, just like the sin of Adam demands a rectification on three dimensions, the sin of the spies likewise demands rectification on three different levels. And therefore, our parsha starts off. It starts off with the sin of the spies. And then we have the mitzvos, the new mitzvos that are its rectifications. 
it starts off with the libations. You have to fix the grape level, so to speak, of the damage that was brought about. And you do that with this mitzvah of the grapes, where you pour the wine at the foot of the altar. And then we have the wheat mitzvah. And that's the challah. When you take the wheat, then you grind it up, you make flour, and you make it into a dough, there is a mitzvah that you do now with the wheat. That's the challah. And then you have tzitzis. And that's the fig. And the Zohar says that the fig leaf that Adam and Eve used to conceal their nakedness, the Zohar says, is akin to the tzitzis. And thus, our Parsha concludes with the fig rectification, and thus our Parsha tells a complete and consistent story. It starts off with the destruction brought about by the spies, and it concludes with the rectification needed to undo and to cleanse and to expiate this terrible sin. And therefore, the Parsha maintains its internal consistency We have the Adam-like sin of the spies, which causes damage on three different dimensions. And then we have the three elements of its rectification, grape, wheat, and fig. Absolute sheer brilliance, courtesy of Rabbi Botnik. Now this sheer genius is a hard act to follow, but I'm going to give it an attempt Nonetheless, I want to suggest a new approach to understand how the Parsha is telling over one idea or one general theme. And this idea is so powerful that if you understand it and you absorb it and you digest it, your life will never be the same. Now, is this too bold of a claim? You listen, you let me know, send me an email, rabbiwalbachimba.com. Let's start off with a question. After the sin of the spies, the nation was told they're going to spend 40 years in the wilderness because you didn't listen to the Almighty and you questioned his benevolence and you rejected and repudiated the land and you wanted to go back to Egypt. You're being punished 40 years for 40 days. And in the end of chapter 14, we read about the defiant travelers. This was a group of people that insisted on ascending and going to the land. And Moshe warned them it's a bad idea. And the Ark of Hashem did not depart the camp. And they, in fact, were slaughtered. But if you think about it, they wanted to do repentance. They wanted to fix what they had damaged. So if you think about it, this sounds like a textbook case of repentance. Yesterday we said that we want to go back to Egypt. And we were castigated, criticized, reprimanded, punished as a result. Now we want to amend. We want to fix. So we're going to be presented with the identical situation. It's dangerous to go into the land. There are Amalekites there. It's dangerous. And we're going to do it nonetheless. To me, that sounds like repentance. You are presented with the identical situation, with the same scenario that you blundered last time. You didn't want to go into the land because it was dangerous. And now you choose to, yes, go into the land, notwithstanding the danger. Yet, they were slaughtered. It was the wrong decision. So why didn't it work? And the answer, of course, is that this is not what repentance is. Repentance doesn't just mean to reverse course and go in the opposite direction of what you did previously. Repentance means to return to God, to restore your behavior, to be in line, to be compliant with the will of the Almighty. And therefore, yesterday, when God said to go into the land and you said no, that was, of course, a sin, but the essence of the sin was a violation of the will of God. 
Today, God's telling you, spend 40 years in the wilderness. The way to repent is not to try to restore the situation of yesterday and to go into the land. That would be a further violation of the will of God. Now he wants you to stay in the wilderness. And the way you repent is by, instead of what you did previously, violating the will of God, now you adhere to him. And now he wants you to stay in the wilderness for 40 years. Repentance is to accept the will of God. Very deep insight. We think of repentance as, you know, you behaved in one way. You behaved in one path. You made a series of choices. And now you make different choices. Opposing choices. What we discover over here is that there's a certain structure to repentance. Repentance is listening to the Almighty. And that does not necessarily mean doing the opposite of what you did previously. Now, the Talmud tells us in the book of Menachos that there's a picture, there's an image, there's a construct that will help us understand how this all works. The Talmud tells us that this world was created with the letter He. Now, when we say He, we're not referring to the things that cows munch on. We're talking about the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, letter He, which is quite helpful for our purposes, to know what this looks like. So it looks like a dalid with a little leg, half leg inside of it, or a ches with the top of the left leg cut off. But think of it as a horizontal line on top and a vertical line connecting to the horizontal line on the right side of that horizontal line going all the way down to the bottom. And then on the left, you don't have a full vertical line going from top to bottom. Instead, you have a small leg, a half a line that doesn't connect from the top to the middle, instead of from the middle to the bottom. I don't know if that made any sense, but I would encourage you, if you don't know what the letter hey looks like, find a picture of it. It's very helpful to understand what we're going to say henceforth. So the Talmud tells us that the world that we're in, the current world, was created with the letter hey. And why? Why was this world created with letter He? Why? Because it is akin to a portico that whoever wants to leave it can leave. If you look at the bottom of a letter He, it's just open. It's just open. There's no floor. If someone wants to leave this world, you could leave. The bottom is open. And why does it have a broken, hanging leg on the left side? There's like a window from the outside getting in. The reason why it has that shape, says the Talmud, is to tell us that if you want to repent, if someone falls out of the bottom of the hay and they want to repent, they go around, swing around the outside and enter through the window. Now, the Talmud asks a question. If you have a hole in the bottom, the hay, after all, is completely exposed at the bottom, so you have a massive gaping window to get back in. Why do you have to make another window on the left side that to provide a way to get back in The same exit can provide an entry. The same bottom of the hay through which someone can leave the world, someone can be restored to the world. Says the Talmud, no, it doesn't work like that. It will not be successful. By the way, that would explain why the world cannot be created with the letter ches. The letter ches is a vertical line on the left, a vertical line on the right, and then a horizontal line connecting those two lines on top. If it was just about having some sort of passageway inside the world to outside the world, the letter ches would be sufficient. But no, it's letter hey. You can fall out from the bottom, but to get back in, you got to climb up all the way up the left side and into the window on the top left. 
This is an amazing picture of this world. If you're in the hay, you're in God's good graces. And you have to work really, really hard to not fall through the floor. And again, there is, there is no floor. You got to tread water, not to sink. You have to levitate if you relax. If you rest on your laurels, if you take the foot off the gas, if you don't consciously make sure that you stay with inside this sphere, you're going to drop out through the hole. But in the event that you drop out, it may seem that there are multiple ways to get back in. But no, if you try going back the way you came from, it won't work. The way to get back in, you have to find the window above the broken left leg. And that's the way to get back in. This is an amazing Talmud, the book of Menachos, page 29b. Now, the basic takeaway of this is like we said earlier, a true penitent doesn't just undo what they did. I fell out of the bottom. I'll just climb back through that same passageway. That's not how it works. You don't simply restore your state. You don't just reverse course, control Z, undo, undo, undo to get back to where you started. You have to find a new way back in. You have to reinvent yourself. But here's the second groundbreaking insight. What happens when someone climbs back in? Where does someone who has fallen out of the bottom and now claws their way back up through the window, where do they end up? When you drop out, when you leave the hay, and you begin to drift away, the point of exit is at the bottom of the hay. But where is the point of re-entry? The entry point back into the sphere of God is much higher than where the exit point was. The true penitents who find the window, they achieve a higher level than those who never left because they scale up those side walls of the hay and they find the window up on top. Now, this idea, it gives new meaning to the Talmud that we've talked about in the past, the Talmud that we love here on the Parsha podcast, the amazing Talmud in the book of Brachos, page 34b, that tells us that the place where the penitents are is higher than the place of the pristinely righteous tzaddikim are. If you have someone who's completely righteous, they've never sinned. They're obviously in a very lofty place. But someone who did sin, who did drift away, who did fall out of the bottom and came back, a penitent, someone like that is on an even higher and loftier place than the pristinely righteous. The penitents, where where are they? Where do they enter when they climb back in? They enter via that window, which is at the very apex of the hay, higher than everyone else. You look at our Parsha, we have this terrible, grievous blunder. The, the nation, the spies, they make this terrible blunder. On a certain level, it's akin to what Adam did. It's terrible. We could say that they, they kind of fell out of this hay. And these insistent travelers, the defiant travelers, they wanted to reverse course. They wanted to undo what they did by defiantly traveling. They wanted to get back into the hay by turning around and entering from whence they exited. But it doesn't work like that. You got to swing all the way around and find the window. Now, of course, it's a lot easier to reverse course than it is to find the window. It's much harder to reinvent yourself, but that is the process. And the Almighty will facilitate that, will enable that, will show you the way to the window above the leg. And that's what he tells the nation. 
you now have 40 years of work. Your mission is much harder. But now when you arrive into the land, you're going to arrive on even a higher level than you would have been had you not sinned to begin with. So this idea of 40 years for the 40 days, is not just a punishment. It's a new roadmap, a roadmap that stands to the very height of the human possibility to even a higher level where they would have been had they not sinned. I want to suggest that maybe this is a big idea that's found all over our Parsha. You know, if you think about it, people are going to fall out of this world. There is no floor. You don't have that protection, that safety measure that ensures that you'll maintain your standing. People are going to fall out and thereby create distance between themselves and their soul. And they're going to be distant from their potential, from, the, from their greatness, from their creator. And this, as we said, is to be expected. It's really rare to find someone that has never fallen out of the hay on any dimension. But when someone does that, they are now required or they are encouraged to find that window. And the window is not at the very location where they hurtled out of this hay. It's in a new place and it's in a higher place. And the net result of that all is a much higher level than would have existed absent the sin. Scripture tells us that the righteous fall seven times and they keep on getting up. And our sages tell us, and we've mentioned this in the past, that the tzaddik is not a tzaddik despite falling down seven times, but precisely because of it. Absent those seven fails, there was no way that the tzaddik could have achieved such a lofty distinction. And after this part of the parsha, we have the sin of the spies, the mistake of those defiant travelers, and we have the new roadmap And then we have three mitzvahs, the libations and meal offerings that accompanies the sacrifices, the mitzvah of challah, and the sacrifices for egregious, erroneous sins. Now, the Sforno, one of the great commentators on the Torah, he says that these mitzvahs are given to people who have fallen out of the hay. And he even stresses, you know, sacrifices did not always need libations. Abraham, Abel, Noah, they all brought sacrifices without the libations. But with the sin of the golden calf, public sacrifices needed libations. And now with the sin of the spies, even private sacrifices now need libations. What he's telling us is, with every sin, with every downfall, with every stumbling and blundering and falling out of the hay, with every sin comes more opportunity, more mitzvos, a roadmap to the window. Post-sin, there is a new mitzvah, a new divine guidance to achieve a higher level, to achieve a level that was previously unattainable. And he says that Chal is the same thing. Only after the sin of the spies, only afterwards, are they given this direction, this guidance of the Chal to get back into the window. And of course, the erroneous, egregious sins, this is a situation that is a mistake, a blunder, but one that leads to a new sacrifice, a new mitzvah, to catapult a person to an even higher level. Now, there is precedent to this as well. Right after the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, we read in verse 21 that the Almighty says, you should build for me an altar made of earth and you should offer sacrifices upon this altar. Wherever you invoke my name, I will come and I will bless you. And the Sephora over there says 
that right after Sinai, they didn't need an elaborate tabernacle with all kinds of gold and vessels and things like that, all these accoutrements of holiness. They didn't need it because they were on this really lofty level. Wherever you invoke the name of God, God will come and bless you. Post the sin of the golden calf, they've fallen out of the hay. It's time to get back up. How do you get back up? You have to have new mitzvahs because now you're going to be catapulted to an even higher level and you're given the godly guidance for how to do that. I would even add that if you think of Adam, what was Adam thinking? Why did he do what he did? So Rashi in the book of Genesis gives us a clue. When the serpent was enticing Adam and Eve to do their sin, he tells them, you will become like God. And Rashi adds a few words. Rashi says, you will be a world builder like God. Now the Talmud tells us that the serpent didn't lie. He was telling the truth. And the truth is that Adam, before his sin, his potential, his greatness was capped. He had a very lofty stature, but he could not become a creator of worlds. Post his sin, he in fact was now enabled to achieve an even higher level, a godly level of being like a world builder, which we spoke about this a long, long time ago which is achieved via Torah. Absent Adam's sin, he had no Torah and had no way to get Torah. Once he did his sin and he just careened, he he fell, he plummeted out of the hay, he was given, or humanity was given, Torah to be able to climb all the way back. And Torah, we spoke about this many years ago, Torah is the tool to become a world builder. So again, there's there's this idea that when someone makes a big blunder, to the degree of the size of the blunder is, of course, how far they fall out of their respective worlds. But that is also going to trigger a new opportunity to have more responsibility and the opportunity for even more greatness via new opportunities and new mitzvahs. Now, of course, Adam's mistake was that he voluntarily, willfully, knowingly made that decision. We don't deliberately leave the hay to be able to climb up the window, even though once we're out of the hay, now we're granted that opportunity. But this, I think, it's a life-changing idea. How many people in history never sinned? Well, the Talmud calculates that there were four such people. There were four people and four people out of billions who never sinned. There were four people who were forever pristinely righteous, remained inside the hay, never dipped their toe out of it. But those people are the absolute minority. The rest of us, we have our ups and downs. And here we're told that in the event that you have a dip, you have a down, you now also have an opportunity to find the window and achieve great heights. Why are the penitents, why are they on such a high level? Why is the only way to become a tzaddik via earlier failures, via falling seven times? Because that is how you get the opportunity to enter via the window at the top. Of course, you don't choose that. If you do that, you probably won't end up with an opportunity to arrive at the top, at the window. But that's the structure. The spies, they fell out. The defiant travelers forgot about the window. And then we have these three mitzvos for window travelers. And finally, we have the end of the Parsha. We have the twig gatherer who was executed. And then we have the Parsha, the section of Tzitzis. I want to suggest that this is two more 
components of this idea of this theme. The Talmud tells us that the twig gatherer was none other than Slavchad. This is the Talmud, the book of Shabbos, page 96b. The Talmud reveals the identity of the anonymous twig gatherer, and it tells us that he was Slavchad, the father of those five sisters that are going to appear at the end of our book, the book of Numbers, and are going to make a claim to earn the inheritance of their deceased father. Now, the Midrash explains the rationale of Tzlavchad. Why was he gathering twigs? Even once he was warned that that would result in his death, why was he doing it? So the Midrash says that he had noble intentions. Because there were some people that said, well, God violated his part of the deal, and therefore we don't need to be obedient of the laws of the Torah. We're not entering the land now? Okay, so the Torah is no longer binding to us. And therefore, Tzlavchad, to stamp out such heresy, he gathered those twigs on Shabbos, was brought to court, and was executed. And when people saw the fate of Tzlavchad, and they saw that he was actually executed for his crime, no one maintained the false understanding that the laws of the Torah, that the deal, so to speak, that we have with God has been undone. It is still binding for all. So this is a really interesting backstory of Slavchad and the individual the Talmud identifies is the twig gatherer. Now, is he a hero or a villain? He was obviously punished. And the Talmud has a whole discussion as to whether or not it was appropriate to reveal his identity. So I want to suggest that maybe we could we could say something about this episode of the twig gatherer that relates to the general theme of our Parsha. He obviously had noble intentions. He wanted to do something good. He wanted to direct the nation in the proper path. They had fallen out of the hay, and he wanted to provide them some guidance. Perhaps his flaw was not in his intention, but in the kind of message he was trying to highlight. Maybe his problem was that he highlighted the wrong point. He was telling them, well, you're out of the hay. You've broken up, so to speak, with God. But the laws of the Torah are still binding even outside the letter hay. The laws are still in effect and you cannot violate them. That was his message, which he very successfully conveyed. Maybe the criticism against him is not in his intention, but in the kind of message that he chose to highlight. Perhaps he should have shown the light on the great potential now available to them. Maybe that was his flaw. What he should have said is, you're out of the hay. But look at what greatness is in store for you. Look at now what you have unlocked via this sinful fashion. And again, no one would ever encourage anyone to deliberately leave the hay in order to get back in on a higher level. It doesn't work like that. If you made a mistake and you blundered, now you're out there? Okay, you should know that now you have rare opportunity than you had previously. That's what he should have conveyed. And that is the message of Tzitzis. Tzitzis talks about someone who maybe has a tendency to deviate after his heart and his eyes. Someone who can get corrupted. And the verse says, you look at your tzitzis and you remember God and you remember the Almighty's mitzvos and you become holy to Hashem, your God. Tzitzis, the power of tzitzis is that it uplifts the people who have fallen to perhaps a very low point and they're deviating after their eyes and after their hearts. They have imbibed the Kool-Aid 
of the Yitzhara, and maybe they've grown distant from God, the tzitzis is like a slingshot to connect someone who's very distant from God, connect them back to their creator. And in fact, the Talmud tells us that the tcheles that we have in our tzitzis, it's blue. So it's supposed to remind you of the sea and of the heavens and of the throne of God. And the Talmud actually brings a wonderful story that we've told over many years ago from the book of Menachos, page 44a. It tells of this man who was very fastidious in the mitzvah of tzitzis, but he liked to uh, visit the women of, of ill repute. And it tells this very elaborate story of this prostitute who charged 400 gold coins for her services. And this guy, this individual, who was very serious about the mitzvah of tzitzis, he wanted to, to visit with her. But he brought his tzitzis, and then when he was in a very low place, spiritually, the tzitzis kind of whipped him on his face and it restored his sobriety, and he became a penitent. And it's a very long and heartwarming and poignant story. He ultimately becomes a balchuva, a penitent. He ends up marrying this woman who became a convert, and he ends up with both this world and the next world. But again, perhaps we can say from this that this is how you're supposed to deal with a situation when someone's in a bad place, they're in a low place, they're depressed, they're not firing on all cylinders, they've fallen out of the hay, they're at a low point, they're at a nadir. The Parsha ends with the tzitzis, Showing us the window, showing us the ability to extricate ourselves from very difficult situations and catapulting ourselves to being close to God, to being holy to God, to being in close proximity to God, to being at a very high level, previously unattainable. What an amazing idea when someone falls and it's almost inevitable. There's no floor. Only four people in history never sinned. What happens now? Now, the table is set. The path is cleared. The opportunity is present. Now, you can become a tzaddik. Now, if you find the window, you can achieve very lofty heights. Again, it's important to stress. If someone willfully jumps out of the hay... It's a very different story. But if someone slips out, there is a way to achieve an even higher level than before if you enter via the window. Let's get to this week's exquisite insight. Now, I must say, when I was still in Houston on Sunday, I found a perfect exquisite insight. I'm like, this is great. I love it. It's great. It's wonderful. I put it in my notes. And then on Tuesday... I was in Cincinnati, and my brother-in-law said something so amazing. I said, I got to write this down. It's coming into my notes. It's going to be the exquisite insight. The other one, I'm putting into my notes for next year. So he says something amazing. You know, the Parsha is really about the episode of the spies. They had a mission, and it just failed catastrophically. On a capitalistic level, what was their mission all about? So if you look at the Hebrew words that describe what Moshe wants of them and what they did, Moshe wants them lasur es ha'aretz, or latur es ha'aretz, which means to scout out the land. But it contains the same letters as the word Torah, latur es ha'aretz, to to perhaps, again, on on a capitalistic level, to discover the Torah of the land. And the idea behind this is every land, every part of the physical environment has a corresponding element in the spiritual world. And therefore, if 
there's Torah that is kind of present or or the energy, so to speak, of a given place, there's also Torah that is the kind of Torah that is considered the Torah of the land of Israel. And if you think about it, the land of Israel is the highest of lands, and therefore the corresponding Torah that relates to the land of Israel must be the highest kind of Torah. And Moshe sent him Lasuris Aretz to go discover the Torah of the land. Why? Because to enable the conquest of something on a spiritual level, you first need to acquire its Torah. If you acquire the Torah of a given land or of a given physical idea, if you understand, if you acquire the spiritual half of it, that enables the conquest of the physical half of it as well. And therefore, in order to acquire the land of Israel, you need to first acquire the Torah that is inherent to the land of Israel. That's an idea. It's a Kabbalistic idea. And that's why it's a 40-day mission. You know, Moshe went to heaven to get the Torah. It was a 40-day expedition in heaven. And mirroring that, we have a 40-day expedition of these 12 exceptional men in the land to acquire the Torah of the land of Israel. So that's point number one. And if you think about it, it kind of failed, right? 10 out of 12, they failed. And two, Joshua and Caleb were successful. And on this Kabbalistic level, Joshua and Caleb were able to acquire the Torah of the land of Israel, whereas the other 10 failed. And the question is, why? Why were Joshua and Caleb capable, again, on this tabulistic level, of acquiring the Torah of the land of Israel, whereas the other ten were unable to do so? This is a very deep idea here. you got to listen to this very carefully. There is another name for the Torah of the land of Israel. And that is the Torah that was present, that was captured in the first set of tablets that Moshe shattered. The Torah of the land of Israel is the Torah of the first set of tablets. And of course, the first set of tablets, Moshe didn't deliver it to us. He shattered it. Only Moshe was privy to it. But that is the Torah of the land of Israel. Now, my contribution to this discussion was the fact that the Talmud tells us that when Moshe shattered the tablets, the letters of the tablets, they flew up into the air. Osios porchos bavir, the, the, the letters of the tablets flew up into the air, into the avir. The Talmud also tells us that the air, the atmosphere of the land of Israel provides wisdom. So I speculated, maybe the reason why the avir, the, the air, the atmosphere of the land of Israel provides wisdom is because those letters that were on the first set of tablets flew up into the avir, parachos ba'avir, they flew up into the avir, and therefore the atmosphere of the land of Israel is still bursting with the Torah of the first set of tablets. But that is point number two. The Torah that they were in pursuit of was the Torah of Moshe, the Torah of the land of Israel. Another way to look at this, the first set of tablets came from heaven on high, and they were made out of sapphire, which we're told is the material of the throne of God. And the verse says in Scripture, Jeremiah 17, 12, that the throne of God is the land of Israel. So again, we have this connection between the first set of tablets and the land of Israel. Now, who is capable of accessing the Torah of the land, the Torah of the first tablets. Only someone regarding whom the first set of tablets were not shattered. The vestiges of the golden calf, which of course resulted in the shattering of the first tablets, that prevented the spies, the ten of them, from accessing the Torah of the first tablets and thereby the Torah of the land of Israel. For them, 
those tablets, that Torah was permanently shattered. Only Joshua and Caleb were untainted, were unsullied by the sin of the golden calf. And therefore, only they had access to the first set of tablets because it wasn't shattered because of them. And therefore, only they were successful in their mission, Lasura Sa'aretz, to go discover the Torah of the land of Israel. Of course, Joshua, he wasn't even in the camp when the sin of the golden calf happened. He was waiting for Moshe at the foot of the mountain, and therefore he is completely guilt-free of the golden calf. Now, Caleb is a little more tricky. Caleb, he was in the camp, and we're assuming that everyone in the camp has some modicum, some degree of guilt. But of course, Caleb's son was Hur, and we know that Hur he was the nephew of, of Moshe and Aaron, and he tried to stop the mob, and they killed him and did the golden calf. Now, in our parsha, it talks about Caleb, who has a different spirit within him. Ekev haisa ruach acheres bo. He had a different ruach. And the Kabbalists tell us that the word ruach is the same as the word chur. Ruach is a resh vav ches, and chur Caleb's son is Ches Vav Reish, the same letters, just in the opposite direction. And what this is revealing to us is that the spirit of Hur, of rebellion and resistance to the mob, was present even in Caleb. And therefore, Caleb was someone who, like Joshua, like Moshe, had some degree of connection to the first set of tablets. It wasn't shattered because of him. And therefore, he had a connection to the Torah of the land of Israel. And therefore, his mission or his capacity to accomplish the mission, the Kabbalistic mission set forth by Moshe to go acquire the Torah of the land of Israel, that was successful. These two people maintained some semblance of a connection to the first set of tablets. For them, it was not permanently shattered. And therefore, for them... The conquest of the land with the Torah of the land was still feasible. They were capable of success in this mission to the exclusion of the other 10. Obviously, it's a very high idea. It's a very lofty idea. There's a few moving parts, but it definitely qualifies as being exquisite. Again, it's not my idea. Courtesy of Rabbi Botnik. Absolute genius. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I'm so glad that we had this partial podcast today from the uh, would-be Torch Center in Canada, the mobile Torch Center in Canada. Have a great day. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Have an incredible Shabbos wherever you may be, uplifting, invigorating in every possible way, physically and spiritually. And please, God, we'll speak again next week. My email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com.